morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the co-organizers, uh, GQUAL, the International Service for Human Rights, TBNET, the International Disability Alliance, and the permanent missions of Mexico and Switzerland, and of course, our Geneva Human Rights Platform, to this event to discuss the transparency in nominations and elections to the UN human rights treaty bodies, asking whether we can go towards a new vetting system. It is a great pleasure for me to hold this event uh, today online with all of you, as we have been discussing this topic already for quite a while. I'll come back to that just in a second. We were planning to uh, include this event already in our annual conference, which we held in October this year in uh, New York. Um, had to postpone somewhat, but so it is of course with great pleasure that I welcome all our panelists here with us today, joining us uh, from Geneva but, and from New York and from elsewhere. So we moved the event online, but we retained uh, the possibility to connect International Geneva and New York for this debate, which actually very much concerns both of uh, those UN hubs in terms of the topic. I have with me here tonight, today, tonight for me already, um, an excellent panel, and I'll just introduce the speakers briefly. We have uh, His Excellency Joel Hernandez, Vice Minister for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights of Mexico, who will start with an opening uh, remarks uh, addressing feminist foreign policy and practice the impact on nominations to UN positions, uh, followed by His Excellency Jörg Glauber, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Switzerland to the UN in Geneva. <clears throat> the panel will be completed by Milica Kolakovic, a member of the Advisory Committee on Nominations of Judges of the International Criminal Court, who is also Vice President of the UN Committee on Enforced Disappearances. His Excellency Robert Ray, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Canada to the United Nations in New York, and uh, my colleague Claudia Martin, who is uh, uh, at the independent panel of, for the election of inter-American commissioners and judges, but also a founding member of one of our project partners here, GQUAL, the GQUAL campaign, and co-director of the Academy on Human Rights and Humanitarian Law. And in summer also, if I may add, Claudia, you were visiting here in Geneva, so we had the pleasure of hosting you for a short while, uh, enhancing the collaboration between our institutions. So to come to the topic, um, the 2020 review of the treaty body system, this review by the General Assembly, addressed the question how to enhance transparency around the nominations and election procedures to UN treaty bodies, and how to enhance compliance with the Addis Ababa guidelines, which are guidelines the treaty body members gave themselves in terms of standards of independence and competence required for treaty body membership. The 2020 review also addressed the issue of diversity in membership, relating, for example, to geographical distribution, but also to gender parity. Yet the current membership structure in the treaty bodies, uh, this uh, structure of 172 independent members serving on those treaty bodies overseeing the implementation of the human rights conventions, this structure does not necessarily comply with all those criteria. And as of now, no vetting procedure has been created except efforts by civil society and individual states. So tonight, or today, we want to discuss what could be done, how, and by whom. What inspiration can we take from other human rights mechanisms or from policies such as feminist foreign policies? I'm actually just myself back from a mission to the Pacific, testing a new follow-up review of implementation of treaty body recommendations. And again, there we saw how the personal engagement, the independence, and the competence of the members of the treaty body delegation traveling with us to the Pacific was key to the success of this activity. And I think it goes also for the whole area of harmonization of strengthening of treaty body work. Uh, treaty bodies are masters of their own rules of procedure. So it is key that actually very competent and diverse membership is elected. And here in Geneva, the treaty bodies meet, but in New York, the elections take place for most of them. Election officers in New York are the ones who are dealing with uh, also vote trading. We might come to that later. So 
what can be done? How can we move forward in that? What are examples to uh, take inspiration for, from? And so it's a great pleasure for me to give the floor to Ambassador Hernandez, first of all, to see what inspiration we can take, for example, from feminist foreign policies, which are declared now by a growing number of states. So over to you, Joel, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felix, and good afternoon to everybody, to your um, fellow panelists and to the public in general. I was requested to talk about the impact of feminist foreign policy on the nomination and election of treaty body members. Let me address it step by step. Currently, around 12 countries in the world have, have had or are developing a feminist foreign policy. Now, in its most ambitious expression, feminist foreign policy is inspired to transform the practice of foreign policy for the greatest benefit of women and girls everywhere. In 2020, Mexico was the first country of the global South to adopt an FFP. It is a set of concrete principles that guide our action. Through a gender perspective and intersectional approach, we seek to eliminate structural inequality and build a more just and prosperous society. I should stress that Mexico's commitment to advancing women's rights and gender equality did not start with our foreign uh, uh, feminist policy, but long before. Gender equality and the rights of women and girls has long been a top priority of our foreign policy. Just let's remember that Mexico hosted the first World Conference on Women in 1975. In that saying, our, our feminist foreign policy can be seen as a consolidation of our historic efforts and a next step to structure them in a coherent and systematic framework. FFP is not an end in itself, but a means to achieve a more ambitious goals and ensure that gender equality remains a top priority in the international agenda. Mexico's foreign policy has two main pillars. The first, one, the first one is internal, and it means that we must apply a gender perspective to improve the conditions of women within our own Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as those who work on, in our duty stations around the world. However, most interestingly for this panel is the external activity. This means foreign policy in action. It takes place in different tracks, including the multilateral track, which involves the work of the Human Rights Council and treaty bodies. And as a consequence, our approach to a candidacy. Um, now, let me move to the second part of this issue, the implications of a foreign, feminist foreign policy in relation to nomination. At the outset, let me say that this part about this is part of a wider discussion regarding gender parity. As you know, the working group on discrimination against against women and girls, a mechanism that was established through a Mexican initiative, uses parity as the measure to assess whether states have complied with the international obligations to ensure women's political um, uh, um, political participation without discrimination. Departing from the point that the best foreign policy, domestic policy, I am pleased to share that in Mexico, we have, we have taken important strides in this regard. Since 2019, gender parity is a constitutional principle that refers to balance, fair, and legal participation, which ensures that just like men, women in all their diversity, have equal participation and representation in the domestic life of our country. We're convinced then that parity must be a key principle of our foreign policy. So in relation to nominations and elections of treaty body members, what have we done? Uh, according to principle one of our feminist foreign policy, we seek to mainstream the human rights approach the gender perspective and intersectionality in all areas of our foreign policy, including candidacy. Since 2020, the candidacies of four strong, 
highly specialized women have been nominated by Mexico and supported by international community to hold high level positions in inter international bodies, two out of which are treaty bodies. Furthermore, we recently nominated another women candidate to the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Different studies have proven that gender equality and transparency go hand in hand. We have no doubt that in a democratic society, greater transparency is more likely to lead to more inclusive and participatory processes. That is why we're con uh, currently analyzing ways to make our nomination processes for Trimsy body members uh, and for regional organizations such as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights even more transparent. I would also like to talk about the other side of the coin, namely, namely how do we make aware decisions when electing treaty body experts? Not only one flip of the coin is the selection of our um, candidates, but then the other part is how we elect treaty bodies. And for that, the conclusions are as follows. We undertake a careful assessment of each candidate's qualifications, knowledge, and experience. Second, we take into account the proven commitment of the nominating country to human rights and to the more specific issue in question. For example, if we are dealing with CEDAW, we are dealing with the Migratory Workers Convention. We look then into the commitment of the nominating country for us to make the selection. And third, we pay attention to the gender and regional balance in the composition of the committee. Um, such um, the Human Rights Council Advisory Committee put forward in 2021 a broad range of interest recommendations for a state, namely inviting countries to identify more female candidates to international body, and also to promote public and participatory selection processes that include gender as a criteria. Such recommendations deserve to be carefully considered by state. In fact, the international community has made important strides regarding equal gender representation in treaty bodies. Today, we are happy to attest that there is a majority of women. Out of uh, the 170 members of the 10 treaty body, 81 MA members are men and 91 are women. In, in addition, the composition of CEDAW has had an important impact of this field. In 2020, the 23 members of CEDAW are women. So to conclude, just let me make some final reflections according to uh, what I've already expressed. First, we need to stay vigilant and proactive. So the trend of increased women participation is not reversed in the future. Second, we have to address the lower presence of women in some of the individual treaty bodies. It is not a matter only of the numbers, but about effectively maintaining the gender perspective. Third, we should look at ways to improve gender balance in those three bodies that are more women dominated. The DAO in particular, in line with the Secretary General's T4C campaign, we need also men to participate in the discussions about women's rights to truly achieve the cultural ex exchange that is most needed. And fourth, in reviewing the candidate's profile, it would be desirable to analyze the proven commitment of all nominees, both women and men, to gender equality and feminism throughout their country. I thank you so much for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, uh, for, for this opening statement. And indeed, uh, very good to hear that the important feminist foreign policy can be really broken down into very practical efforts and seeing the, the two uh, sides of it, the internal, but then as you mentioned, the external dimension of FFP for Mexico, I think that external track is really 
very important in our discussions. So thank you very much uh, for sharing those examples and for putting the points forward of how to how to go forward from here. With this, it is my pleasure to give the floor to Ambassador Jörg Lauber, who uh, before being the permanent representative to Geneva was permanent representative of Switzerland to New York. So I think even personally, uh, Jörg, you're representing a very good bridge for this process of elections on the one side of the Atlantic and treaty bodies sitting on the other. And of course, also you've been personally involved in the review, the 2020 review that I was just mentioning in the opening. So I'm very much interested in hearing from you on your perspectives on this topic of how to go forward in uh, enhancing transparency in nominations and elections of treaty body members. So Jörg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Felix. Uh, Deputy Minister, Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, first of all, thanks again, Felix, to you and the Academy for uh, this event. I think it's a, it's an important topic and also thanks for how you frame the event, including uh, indeed people uh, from Geneva and New York and I hope uh, some other places tuning in uh, this afternoon. Um, it, it is really an issue that is uh, close at our hearts. You know, we, uh, we very much value the, the treaty body system. And key to the, 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 the success of the system and also the legitimacy and, uh, of the system is, of course, the members we send uh, to this treaty body. So the nomination of independent and impartial members is, is absolutely of, of key importance. For the quality then uh, of these treaty bodies and we see it i think uh, more and more you know when when you have a tendency of um a lot of you questions around uh, human rights are let's say um at least hotly discussed uh, uh, on on the political side the human rights council where the atmosphere is more political we need the treaty bodies all the more to be to be to reflect quality and, and to to create trust uh, through their work, but uh, again, first starting with the quality of uh, of the members of these of these bodies. So, very much according to the example uh, the um, Mexican Vice Minister just gave, when Switzerland nominates candidates, we really look very closely at uh, the professional uh, qualifications, uh, the personalities. Uh, they need to be, of course, of, of high moral standing. We're looking, we're really betting them uh, very closely. We're also working with civil society. Uh, one prominent example is uh, our candidate, or actually now members for the second time already, uh, Markus Schäfer, who was re-elected re -elected last year and is now serving in his second mandate at the Committee on the Rights of People with Disabilities, where we work closely with national, the National Association for people with disabilities, uh, listened uh, to their requirements, what they felt was important, what quality uh, this candidate should have, the person that should serve uh, in the committee. And that was a very successful cooperation. Other examples uh, of, of people, candidates we recently sent to the treaty bodies, uh, uh, Professor Philippe Schaffe, who is on the Child Rights Convention Committee, again, a person with a long standing high reputation in the field. Daniel Fink who is currently completing his last mandate on the subcommittee on the prevention of torture. All of them with long, long experience. We have a candidate also for CEDAW again, Erika Schappi, uh, who will be running for a term 25 to 28, same procedure, close vetting, looking at the personal qualifications, talking not just within government, uh, um, but uh, civil society to make sure that once they're in, after the campaign, of course, uh, we are very engaged in their campaigns, but once they're in, uh, uh, they need to be independent and we need to respect their independence. They need to be there uh, due to their qualifications and experience. Um, beyond our own candidates uh, that we are trying to bring to these treaty bodies, we are really committed to contributing to balanced, to, to well-balanced uh, committee membership uh, as a whole, uh, geographical balance, uh, and then of course, uh, a gender balance as well. So we, we want to support that uh, very much. The 
the selection I just mentioned is not totally gender balanced, and we we agree that uh, there is still a room for improvement. We regret that the gender balance in the treaty bodies is not great yet, and we are really trying uh, on the one side uh, from with our own candidates to to, to promote uh, qualified women candidates, but then also when it comes down to to elections, to to consider that really to make sure that we have a, a better balance within the treaty bodies. Um, there's of course um, other steps to do that. It's not just you, you can't just look at this. We have to create an environment to promote gender balance in the system as a whole. So we do uh, support programs like the gender Accred accreditation program. It's a program that aims to advance gender equality and the rights of women and girls within the working culture of the Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. We also participate in other uh, initiatives. One uh, I've been very engaged with in New York and also back here in Geneva now is the International Gender Champions Initiative. So I think it, it needs a whole culture you now around the treaty bodies, not just the treaty bodies. In the system, in the UN system, we need a culture of better, of better uh, gender balance. As I said, uh, there is room for improve, of, uh, improvement. In this review you mentioned, in the 2020 review, we made a couple of proposals on how uh, the transparency could be improved. So the awareness for member states of uh, where we need to maybe make decisions and what decisions to make when we vote, um, that, that, to, that the awareness is increased. One proposal was to have um, information available at an early stage on all candidates so we know what kind of uh, selection we have we can choose and pick from and then and then elect that already gives us an idea of what uh, which ones we as a, a member country would pick to a, um, have and assure a better balance again gender or geographical etc in the body and then another proposal is we and we still think that could be done better. The High Commissioner's Office could prepare an information note, including information on practical issues, uh, to make sure that the right people um, are 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 coming forward as candidates. So explain exactly what the duties are for members of the of the of the treaty bodies. What are the current what's the current composition of the treaty body? To see what kind of profile we need to select to um, address possible existing imbalances in, in gender or, or other issues in the treaty body. So a number of things we feel that still um, could be done. You mentioned the whole, I'm sorry for the expression, horse trading or this, this exchange of votes in election um, processes. That's also, of course, an issue. Um, I think uh, member states should look at uh, sooner or later, or rather sooner than later, because what we really need in all these uh, in all these organs and treaty bodies, etc., is first and foremost well qualified candidates, independent uh, people who convince uh, through their professionalism, through their moral standing, and then. As of course we're discussing today, the, the right gender, regional balance, uh, etc. But that's some of the points I wanted to share with you. Thanks again. I have to run away. I apologize. I would love to stay for the discussion, but as you said, there's a lot of things going on, and I have to go back to the Global Refugee Forum, uh, which is uh, over on the other side of the hill in Geneva, continuing tonight. But thank you very much for having me, and, and again, thanks for this event. I can't hear you. Maybe the others cannot hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg, for your intervention. And I understand that also colleagues from your mission will be also staying throughout the debate, maybe to come in also later again in the discussion after the presentations. So thank you for mentioning, of course, the Swiss practice on both uh, nominations and elections, like we heard from Mexico, but also that uh, call for more information available well ahead of the election. And I think the uh, co-facilitator report talked about an open and transparent web-based electoral platform, I'm quoting the report here, to, 
uh, evaluate the merits of treaty body candidates. And so it's a pleasure to have uh, Milica Polakovic uh, next, as a next speaker, not only uh, vice president of the Committee on Enforced Disappearances, so a treaty body member herself, but actually member of the advisory committee of nominations of judges uh, of the International Criminal Court. So also to hear from you, Milica, about uh, how actually other bodies have already established such open and transparent platforms or other mechanisms that the co-facilitators were thinking about. So uh, Milica, over to you. Thank you, Felix. Good afternoon, Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, and thank you actually for your interest in this important topic. Yeah, indeed, I'm in parallel member of both bodies. So basically, I'm in position to recognize and identify both the existing gaps, but also some positive practices that could be exchanged between two mechanisms. And I will try to be brief at this stage and to share with you some of the recent developments uh, by ICC. First of all, as Ambassador Hernandez has already underlined, we need to distinct between two probably equally important stages of the process. The first stage is the national nomination procedure, and the second stage is the procedure before, in this case, ICC. So before 2023, the ICC procedure of nomination and election of judges was pretty simple. Upon a call, the state parties present the candidates, and according to Article 36 of the Rome Statute, uh, the state parties need to follow uh, either the procedure of electing Supreme Court judges in their uh, respective countries, either the procedure for nomination of judges of the International Court of Justice. Those candidates then fill out the uniform questionnaires prepared by the ACN, and the questionnaires are publicly available. So. Uh, they are also uh, assigned a standard declaration for all candidates that clarifies whether they are aware of any allegations of misconduct, including, of course, sexual harassment made against them. After that, the next stage is that candidates are interviewed by ACN. The ACN evaluates their knowledge, their skills, as required by the Rome Statute, and prepares the report to the ASP, uh, which at the final stage, of course, elects ICC judges. So that was uh, the old procedure. So what's new in the procedure since this election cycle uh, conducted this year? In 2020, the ICC conducted independent expert review uh, of the functioning of the court, and that review was aimed actually at improvement of different aspects of the functioning of the court, but also uh, a set of recommendations were made uh, tackling the issue of election of judges. Following those recommendations, the ASP adopted the resolution in 2021 and tasked uh, ACN to do the three important things. The first thing is to collect and analyze information on the national nomination procedures already existing in the state parties, based on those information to prepare a compendium identifying the main common elements between uh, national nomination procedures, and at the final stage to prepare a non-binding document, non-binding instrument, to the attention of the state parties when forming or amending uh, the rules governing their over national nomination procedures. So it could be, it should be like a set of criteria which should be applied in the national nomination procedures. I'm going to explain later on where we stand now in implementation of these three tasks. However, in addition to this, um, in 2023 election process, uh, we had some uh, also important improvements, uh, also three important improvements. The first one was introducing vetting process conducted by IOM, Independent uh, Oversight Mechanism, resulting into the report on each candidate presented by state parties. And the purpose of this vetting process was actually to assess their high moral character. The second very important novelty uh, was that we actually introduced the language test. Um, namely, all the candidates were offered to take voluntarily 
either English or French test prepared by the Registry's Language Services section. And what is really uh, illustrative and uh, interesting is that only six of 14 candidates accepted to be tested. So we should think about this further. The third important novelty was uh, that the round tables were organized with the participation of the candidates, uh, state parties, representatives, and NGOs. And state parties, representatives, and NGOs were actually offered and free to pose many questions to the candidates as a way to ensure more merit-based approach uh, of the state parties during the voting in the ASP. And those round tables were globally broadcasted via UN Web TV and chaired by uh, His Excellency, Mr. Ambassador Ray. So we have made some important um, improvements in terms of the procedure before ICC. But I believe that such improvements needs to be also done in terms of the national nomination procedures. Uh, I already mentioned that uh, the ACN was requested to collect and uh, to compile data on the existing national nomination procedures. And until today, only 35 state parties, 35 of 123 state parties uh, have submitted such information. So it could mean actually that in many state parties, the national nomination procedures in line with the Rome Statute either don't exist or they are not fully respected in practice. And in order to change that, uh, uh, in ACN, we have already started developing the guidelines uh, for the state parties. And our intention is to uh, develop and to adopt this document uh, in autumn 2024, the latest, to be brought to the ASP attention next December. Therefore, it's, it is really important to understand that we are not running into the unification or full uh, uniformity of the national nomination procedure, but we are actually trying to define kind of common minimum standards to be respected to ensure transparency and integrity and inclusiveness of the national nomination procedures, uh, considering the fact that this is the actually the main prerequisite of having the high quality candidates proposed to ACN and later on to ASP. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving us those details, Milica, and also the, the update of how this procedure is evolving. And I think just what you ended on, very interesting also to say, you're not trying to uniform uniform something, but actually to see what are minimum standards. And I think this is also interesting. And I think we other speakers might still come to that, or maybe we'll come back to that in the discussion to see what could really be taken over for the vetting process, for a vetting process for, for your colleagues, you and your colleagues in the treaty bodies. And of course, there also, as we said in the concept note, 2024, we'll see a vote of uh, 60 members uh, to the treaty bodies. So it's also quite a volume of candidates. So how such procedures can be actually adapted. But with this, and you mentioned already, His Excellency Robert Ray, I'd like to give the floor to you and uh, thank you for joining us from New York to personify this connection between Geneva and New York to hear from your experiences, of course, uh, linked to the ICC, but also the views of how to take that process forward and be inspired within the treaty body system. So, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it's lovely to see uh, the picture of the celeb in the background. I, I went to the international school as a teenager, so uh, Geneva has a very special place in my in my heart. Um, I will just say, I will just confirm what Melissa said about uh, the the ICC process and how we have really, really tried to move it along in terms of uh, vetting, but also in terms of our, our own internal processes, looking at what we need to do to, uh, to deal with uh, gender imbalance. And I would just make a couple of observations on that. One of the challenges, of course, is that many people are hired for a period of time um, in, in the organization itself. Um, and we recognize we have a gender and diversity issue with the court, which we have to deal with. Uh, but it's, 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 it takes time and persistence to, to be able to deal with it effectively. 
On the question of the judges, we've again, we've moved the yardsticks by putting higher standards for member states, uh, as has been described, and also uh, by having our own vetting process and the roundtables and discussions uh, underway uh, to allow people to make their assessment. However, um, in the end, it, it, the judges are elected. And, and so he said to me, uh, do all the steps that we've taken ensure that the most qualified people get elected or that uh, it's, 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 it reflects gender diversity and, and other important elements of diversity? The answer is no, there's no guarantee any more than there is in a, any democratic uh, process. And, and that is an ongoing challenge that we have. So one of the things I wanted to describe, and I really will just focus on this for purposes of our discussion, because I want to get to the questions in the debate, is to describe for you the process that we went through as a government in deciding to nominate uh, Laverne Jacobs to be um, our first ever candidate to the Committee on the Rights of, of Persons with Disability. Uh, Dr. Jacobs, very highly qualified um, professor of, at the in Faculty of Law at the University of Windsor, um, a disabled person herself, uh, a, a very, very strong advocate, deeply knowledgeable. And um, what we did to find her was to set out domestically to issue a call for expressions of interest, um, which was shared with every organization we could, we could think of, to have a, a selection committee that was made up of government officials who were assessing uh, the candidates. Um, and that that committee had a, had gender balance and included persons who self-identified as having a disability. Um, we then had a short list um, to interview after which they selected their preferred candidate, which was Dr. Jacobs. So uh, we, we didn't just pick a name out of the hat and say, that's our candidate. We said, how can we find the best possible candidate? And that candidate was ultimately uh, successful um, all candidates were, were evaluated equally based on their background in human rights, their experience in disability issues, and domestic, international, and UN experience. As a result of adopting the policies that we have as a government, uh, we apply a gender lens to everything, uh, to all appointments, and not only a gender lens, but also a diversity lens. And, and that's as it should be, with the underlying principle that everybody has to be qualified. Um, we, we attach a lot of importance to making sure that the candidates that we choose are going to be candidates who will stand uh, the test of public scrutiny. Um, over our half our candidates that we've nominated over the past 10 years um, have been women. Um, this includes Marcia Cran, who's just been reelected on the Human Rights Committee, Dr. Jacobs, who I talked about. Kim Prost, who's um, now a judge on the International Criminal Court, and Shauna Olney, who's on the International Civil Service Commission. And I've been involved in e each one of these uh, processes. Uh, and we, we all, we just, as a matter of course, we just apply the test to say, is, is this a best person? Um, and when we identify best, we wanna make, make it clear that we apply the gender lens because we think it has to be applied as well as the diversity lens, because we think that has to be applied as well. Sometimes there are critics who say, well, if you apply the gender lens, you apply the diversity lens, you don't always get the best people, in quotation marks. And our test is we want to get the people who are who are highly qualified, and, and, and then we want to begin to apply some other criteria because we think that's important as, uh, as well. Um, just a word about vote swaps. Um, when I heard, I hear, chatter about vote swaps, I always say it's, you know, everyone who, who talks about it is always a little embarrassed. And I'm always reminded of the St. Augustine's famous prayer where he said, make us, make us pure, O Lord, but not quite yet. Um, the fact of the matter is um, vote swaps are pretty much an institution at the moment. Uh, they, they have their problems, um, but we, 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 we don't engage in this uh, without a lot of scrutiny and a lot of consideration as to the uh, qualifications of the candidates that are being considered. Um, it's not something that we leap into saying, yeah, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, we, we apply the same tests that we apply to these processes that I've described and have been described by others. 
um, we apply the same the same tests. Um, whether or whether or not that system will eventually change, I don't know. Um, I do know that when we look, for example, at the election of judges, both to the ICJ and to the ICC, um, in which I play a role. I mean, obviously, in advising the government, um, and, and we all talk about wh where this should go. Um, we have a long discussion about what the qualification of the candidates is and whether we can, in fact, do it in the conditions that's being proposed. It's not something we enter into lightly um, or carelessly. Um, but again, as I said before about uh, elections, um, you know, everybody says they don't like vote swaps, but everybody does it. Uh, and so, with the exception of one or two countries, they say they don't. And, and, you know, the, the other thing is, we don't know what countries do actually because votes are secret. Um, and we really have no idea what what uh, what criteria countries in the end apply, and that's a problem. But we're we're it, it, we're there's a creative tension here that we need to sort of understand. I think and embrace. We we can't just rely on the old boys network, and we can't rely on the old boys system. Uh, and we are doing whatever we can to move well beyond and and, and past that. Um, we need to make sure we're canvassing as widely as possible for people who are qualified and interested. Um, and there are internal processes that can be followed, as we did with Dr. Jacobs, to ensure that that's actually what happens, that it is a transparent process. Everybody can see what the process is, and this is how this candidate emerged as the favorite candidate. I, I think those are things we member states can be encouraged to do. We, I don't know to what extent it can be legislated. Uh, but I do think it's important to do it. In the case of the ICC judges, we pretty well have changed the system. Um, and um, But at the end of the day, you come back to this point that there are elections and elections are not um, are not a predictable thing. I, I, I speak of, <laughs> to this as a former elected person. Um, you don't know why you get elected when you when you're running for public office, but it happens. Um, and elections have an element of unpredictability. What we need to do is focus on the things that we can control as member states and the things that we can change as member states to improve the quality of candidates and to ensure that there is um, uh, a true commitment to equality and a true commitment to the full participation of women and people with disabilities and people of diverse backgrounds. This is the approach we have to take. Um, finally, just on a personal note, I, I would observe that in my experiences uh, in, in politics, and particularly my experience in Ontario where I was Premier, um, changes can be made, change can happen. Uh, I've seen it happen, and I've seen people's views about the need for change evolve as well. And that has, I think, influenced uh, my candor in direct, in direct discussions with other PRs here in New York to say, we really got to deal with this problem because if we don't have uh, a gender equality, we don't have a, a, a respect for diversity, we're actually not getting the best candidates. Um, and, and we all know that. So let's let's make that change happen and, and let's work, work our way through. Thanks for the opportunity to chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And indeed, so uh, making that change, I think, will be really the crucial point. And I think we hear Canada, Mexico, and Switzerland leading by example in national processes and, and your, your own standards. <clears throat> but how to make that actually um, a more standardized practice uh, will be something we might come back to in, in the discussion. And also coming out of the pledging conference just two days here in Geneva, I think a pledge of vote swaps or uh, vote trading only on qualified candidates can be, a, can be a good step in that direction. But let's hear from Claudia Martin first, um, also about the experience in the inter-American human rights system, what actually with your campaign also uh, you have been able to, to achieve there, both in terms of gender parity, but I think also more broadly in terms of the vetting processes, again with that perspective of how can that serve as an example for some more institutionalized procedure in the treaty body election and nomination procedures. So Claudia, over to you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Felix. And I'm delighted to be um, surrounded by these distinguished speakers and also to um, be hearing from uh, the ambassadors from uh, Canada, um, Ambassador Joel Hernandez, who I know quite well and has been very much involved in this for many years, and um, uh, ambassador, the ambassador from uh, Switzerland. I think it's very good for those who are trying like myself to uh, improve the nomination and selection processes to hear from all those of you. I'm going to speak a little bit about the independent panel to evaluate the candidates to the uh, Inter-American Human Rights System, uh, which is quite interesting because it has been uh, established, it was established in 2015 in response to a call from civil society organizations. This was initially conducted and organized by civil society organizations to strengthen transparency and participation in the nomination and election processes uh, of the members of the Inter-American Commission and judges of the Inter-American Court. But um, there has been an important development since uh, 2018. My university, American University, the Washington College of Law, the law school has been serving as the secretariat for the panel because the, we understood that it was important for the panel to have a separation from civil society to uh, strengthen and to ensure independence and impartiality of the findings. Um, since the creation of the first panel in 2015, uh, we have had six, six rounds of uh, assessment uh, on, uh, on, on election periods for both members of the Inter-American Commission and judges of the Inter-American Court. That includes the last session in 2023 uh, regarding members of the Inter-American Commission. Uh, one important thing is that the panel is comprised of uh, six, five or six, depending on the years, uh, independent experts who volunteer their work. Um, they're not necessarily always the same uh, experts, but we uh, pretty much select the experts from the human rights community in the Americas. Uh, and I want to say that in the last few years, I'm, I'm very glad that we have had indeed gender parity in the composition of the panel itself. Um, one problem that we face as with uh, the other, so, some of the oldest human rights treaties is that the American Convention and the statutes of the Inter-American Commission and the court do, do not have or have a very limited number of requirements uh, for um, being uh, nominated and selected as a commissioner or a judge. These criteria include mostly two uh, requirements. Number one, uh, having a high moral authority, and number two, recognize competence in human rights, pretty much expertise in this uh, field. Uh, in the case of the Inter-American Court, there's an additional requirement that the candidates must possess the qualifications required for the exercise of the highest judicial functions, meaning should be qualified to serve in the Supreme Court or constitutional courts of the uh, country. However, beyond this, there is nothing else in the instruments. And so, um, there is uh, no uh, references for requirements uh, uh, at the national for nomination at the national level or either selection at the um, uh, organize at the level of the Organization of American States. And of course, as with the other uh, processes, this has uh, created uh, you know processes that lack sometimes transparency, independence, and many times uh, uh, end up electing or selecting candidates who do not necessarily are the most qualified for the uh, positions. Um, uh, it's interesting, however, that because of the work of the civil society organizations, including the Chiqual campaign that I have uh, founded and with which I work, in the last uh, uh, selection uh, period, three countries on their own decided to have their own no national nomination processes. Uh, some of them are uh, better articulated than others, but the effort is well uh, you know, uh, uh, it, we are very grateful that they made the effort to create these processes. They were the, uh, the processes were created by Argentina, uh, the USA, and uh, Chile, three countries that nominated candidates, uh, two of them women, by the way. Um, uh, also, as the result of the uh, efforts by civil, the lobbying of civil society of organizations, the General Assembly of the Organization of American States has um, also adopted a number of resolutions. Uh, in recent years, calling states to nominate more women, to have a, a, to consolidate a, a balanced gender representation, but also to have equal, equitable uh, regional geographic representation and appropriate balance of population groups, uh, pretty much a reflection on the diversity of the uh, and the richness 
of uh, the culture in, in the Americas. Uh, interesting uh, also is that as part of all these efforts in the last election process um, nominate, uh, the, uh, for the Inter-American Commission, we indeed have parity. We have six candidates, three women and three males, and the outcome were two women and two men were elected as members of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, I want to describe briefly the metho methodology that the panel follows. Uh, they pretty much uh, assess uh, uh, the resumes and the information provided by the candidates, the responses that the candidates provide to questionnaires that the uh, panel sent uh, to uh, those who are uh, running for a position, um, an interview that is conducted which is with, uh, by the panel with each of the candidates, and then information received by uh, civil society. The panel also looks for uh, information from open uh, sources and other information that is sometimes even provided by states or the uh, missions to the Organization of American States. In terms of the criteria, which I think is very important to uh, consider, uh, the panel takes uh, into account uh, not only the two criteria that are provided in the instruments, high moral authority and recognized expertise in human rights, but it also considers three additional elements. Number one, the independence, impartiality and the absence of conflicts of interest of the candidates. Number two, the contribution to the representative and balanced integration of the body, gender parity, diversity, uh, geographical uh, representation. And uh, lastly, uh, whether or not the candidates have gone through a national nomination process. This is one of the considerations that the panel makes as a final uh, assessment. Uh, the panel produces a report that is uh, um, assess, that, uh, assesses all the uh, merits of each, of each candidate along the um, uh, requirements that I mentioned. It is presented to the missions uh, um, of the state parties to the Organization of American States and subsequently released to the public, um, depending on the years, uh, three, four weeks before the elections uh, take place. And the way the candidates are assessed is whether or not they meet the evaluation criteria, if they meet some of the evaluation criteria, and or if they don't meet the evaluation uh, criteria. Um, finally, I want to say that um, the panel uh, every year uh, that um, uh, makes the assessments for candidates, uh, issues some recommendations that are important towards the improvement of the nomination and selection process. Uh, in the last year, uh, the uh, panel emphasized the importance of the development of national uh, nomination procedures, as Milika uh, mentioned before, and also requested the General Assembly of the Organization of, of American States to uh, request the Inter-American uh, Juridical Committee to develop a model framework law for nomination processes that can be adopted at the domestic uh, level. Another important aspect that the committee, uh, that the panel recommended is that a state should not nominate candidates who hold positions in the executive branch. Uh, even if then when they are, uh, if elected, they decide to resign. So the panel has been calling for a cooling period, mostly for ensuring um, independence and impartiality, uh, and not because of the personal qualifications of the candidates, but also for the uh, you know, perception of uh, lack of impartiality or independence. And then I finally want to mention that this panel has uh, been, uh, since its in inception, requesting the Organization of American States to create a consultative group very similar to the one that Milika described for uh, the ICC or even uh, the one uh, for the uh, selection of uh, the uh, judges of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, but unfortunately, in our region, the Organization of American States and the members of the organization have not had the appetite, the political appetite to take over uh, these responsibilities. So the panel continues to do its job. Uh, we are preparing now for the next round of elections that will take place next year. Um, uh, with candidates for the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. So in some, I think that this process, even if it's not perfect, and even not if it's, even if it's not institutionalized, as in the case of the ICC, could serve as an excellent model for uh, um, uh, um, studying the process, a vetting process uh, regarding candidates for the uh, UN uh, treaty bodies, um, uh, uh, human rights treaty bodies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia, for that addition also about the experiences in the 
inter-American system and I think later uh, in the discussion and now we'll have about 20 minutes left for discussion. You might also come back to whether states have actually followed the recommendations of the panel because we know also from civil society initiatives in the treaty bodies that some civil society initiatives have taken also stands against the election of some um, members of some treaty bodies and uh, they nevertheless uh, got elected. So the question is that what level uh, such independent panels actually will have a clout to really uh, impact on, on decisions and uh, on votes, which are by definition, as Ambassador Ray said, uh, unclear in outcome. But with this, let me throw open the floor to the participants of this webinar. And I see already two requests and I'll give the floor to those colleagues to uh, post their questions themselves. But I ask them to please keep it very short. So we do have time within the remaining 20 minutes to come back and give an opportunity to each of the panelists to react to your questions. And so first one on my list is uh, Juan Ignacio Perez Bello. And uh, thank you also Juan Ignacio for being here and for co-sponsoring the event uh, on behalf of International Disability Alliance. Juan Ignacio, please. Thank you very much. Uh, Felix, do you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for taking the lead uh, for, and to the Geneva Academy for taking the lead on the organization of this event and for the interventions of the distinguished panelists. I'm uh, Juan Ignacio Perez Bello. I work for International Disability Alliance uh, here in uh, Geneva, uh, especially focusing on UN uh, treaty bodies. We have uh, been um, an uh, International Disability Alliance is also part of the TVNet a coalition on uh, UN uh, treaty bodies, which includes eight members with a, a close a working relationship with different uh, treaty bodies. I wanted to, to mention here one practice that we do for each uh, single um, treaty body election, um, which is the practice of the uh, UN TV's elections website, which is a website in which uh, we, for which we offer candidates to treaty body elections to uh, respond to in-depth uh, questionnaires, um, to assess better the profile, and we offer them as well to uh, develop promotional videos uh, targeting two or three of the main uh, more relevant questions in terms of substance to, to in order to promote visibility of the process and hoping that it serves states or um, officials both in Geneva and New York to get to know a little bit better the, the candidates for the election. Uh, in this sense, I, I think one one uh, one comment that I have and a reflection is the issue of uh, of uh, time frames because we usually feel from civil society organizations that there is a strong need for alignment of uh, the time frames the formal time frames for elections uh, procedures uh, for nominations and election procedures with the reality of the practice we know that many candidates to treaty bodies start campaigning many, almost one year before the election. And then the deadline for nominations is very near. Uh, it's just two months before the election process. So all the information that can be produced, uh, it can only be produced for very little time when most of the things, most of the voting is already uh, cooked and decided. Uh, and then I wanted just to point out, uh, hoping that there are uh, state officials in the event, I wanted to point out three major gaps for the next uh, CAPD committee elections, which are the need to ensure a geographical representation from Eastern Europe. There is no uh, CAPD committee member from Eastern Europe at the moment. Um, then the need to increase disability diversity. This uh, vast majority of uh, blind persons and persons with physical disability uh, and other constituencies uh, do not have any representation. And uh, lastly, uh, thinking on gender balance, um, we had had uh, good experiences in campaigning together with uh, GQAL, especially for two, 2018. And we hope that gender parity can be kept and that would only require at least to uh, elect uh, three women among the nine candidates that will be, uh, um, the nine seats that will be at stake. I appreciate any reflection in terms of time frame and also 
if possible, uh, on the potential complexities of having panels for Titivari selections by the by the speakers. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Juan Ignacio. And of course, yes, the UNTP TB elections website is very important, uh, as would be, of course, its update. I think uh, we have, as I mentioned, 60 uh, posts in the treaty body system coming up next year. And so any information that could be on that website, of course, in time would be really good. Um, I saw another hand popping up of uh, somebody who wanted to take the floor, but it did disappear again on my screen here. So I'm not sure if we have others who would like to take the floor. I see also a comment in the Q&A, um, but uh, not so much a direct question. So gender and uh, pay. Um, I think uh, we're an independent uh, experts who are working on a non-paid basis here in the treaty body system. That's, of course, also a specificity here. Um, yes, I see Alexandro Alvarez, and then I'll give the floor to Robert Ray also to, to continue our discussion. First to uh, Alexandro, please. Good morning, good afternoon to everybody. I'm Alexandro Alvarez. I'm the Human Rights Attaché at the Mission of Chile to the Organization of American States. And I have a very specific question to Professor Martin. Um, in terms of what are your reflections on the set of set of rules, considering especially the last elections at the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights to promote uh, uh, independence and excellency in terms of the career on human rights for the commissioners and the rules for the inclusion of the independent panels itself in the institutional framework for the election uh, in, in the case of especially Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. And would we have more questions from the audience as we only have the possibility for one round of questions? Please don't hold back with your questions. You should post them now actually as we're uh, having about 10 minutes left uh, before the end of this event. So. Just one quick look again into the list. Uh, if anybody else uh, would like to speak, please raise your electronic hand so we can give you the floor. I'm not seeing any further requests there. So uh, while some might still come up with a request, let me turn to Ambassador Ray, please. Thank you. I'm afraid, I appreciate it. I'm afraid I have to go, but um, I did want to respond to the first um, questioner um, about um, the issue of uh, open interview sessions with the candidates. Um, that's a great, we do that. That's an absolutely standard practice for us um, in our campaigning for, for candidates uh, to ask them to come forward, to do open sessions, to present themselves, to engage. The Secretary General has to go through that process. Uh, so do the ICC judges, and I think it's very important for, for that to be done in every situation. I don't think anybody should be voting uh, without having had an opportunity to see using UNTV and other means of, of, of communicating um, to help countries to determine who's qualified and who isn't, what their views are. I, I just think it's essential. We, we have adopted this practice ourselves as a standard practice. And we would encourage other countries to do it um, because we think it's it's uh, it's essential. Um, so I'm, I know there was another question for for Claudia, but I'll let her answer that. But I just wanted to get that point in that uh, I think that's a critical element that we can we actually can make that change happen. It's a standard practice for many countries. There's no reason why everybody shouldn't shouldn't do it, and it, it can be actually can be something that we mandate um, as as we look at the. The process is going um, going forward. I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to speak, but I'm afraid I do have to have to run as I as I uh, attend to some other duties that have come up. So thank you very much for this. Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, we we might actually take that and uh, that also then forward to see what, for example, in the upcoming resolution in the General Assembly at the end of 2024, which will take up again the strengthening of the treaty body system, whether that might be a place where progressive countries could actually include some language uh, along the lines of what Ambassador Ray just said, 
institutionalizing, mandating a, a mechanism to really uh, put that good practice, which is a completely voluntary national practice for the moment, to a next step. So I think, I don't know if uh, Ambassador Hernandez, you would like to talk on that, but also maybe the other panelists, your views on how this could be taken forward, because as we see again, from those very positive practices of some states, it doesn't necessarily mean a uniform practice, even if some are leading by examples for other states. So, so how to how to go there? But I'll come to Claudia next. As also, there was a direct question for you again on the inter-American system, but maybe also to comment directly on the way forward for the treaty bodies, as we're in our last round of statements. Claudia, please. Thank you very much, Felix. I, I wanted to say that it's true, and I think Juan Ignacio, Ignacio mentioned that it's very uh, different if you have 10 treaty bodies as opposed to what we have in the Inter-American system. In the last uh, election cycle, we had um, initially 10 candidates that were reduced to six. So of course, it's much more manageable, and that makes a difference in terms of the ability of the uh, panel to pretty much assess each and every candidate. So I would say that that, of course, is a challenge for the uh, UN um, uh, human rights treaty bodies. Uh, in regard to your question and the General Assembly, I want to say that the work that the uh, civil society organizations have done with the General Assembly of the Organization of American States has been very effective. And indeed, the resolutions that have been adopted since 2016 have been uh, uh, crucial, I would say, for the states that have nominated and also in the end for the final outcome of, of the election. It's not perfect, but I think it has been uh, important. So I would say that having that uh, call for states to improve uh, um, national selection processes and also uh, improve uh, the, the, the selection process uh, at the international level uh, makes a lot of makes a difference. Even if it's not perfect, I think it makes a, a complete uh, difference. Difference. I want to say that uh, in our case, and I'm, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Wright and, uh, and Ambassador Joel Hernandez are from the region. Uh, in the last uh, selection uh, process at the Organization of American States, uh, the uh, final assessment of the panel was that three candidates met the requirements and three did um, may, uh, met some of the requirements. And when we follow the selection process, the election itself at the General Assembly, some states voted only for the three candidates that met the requirements. So I think that step by step, we can make changes, uh, even if, uh, of course, the system is complicated. Uh, in regard to uh, the question from Alexandra, um, I wanted to say that, of course, I didn't have the time to explain, but the panel um, has a, an extensive uh, description of what e what of the each what uh, each of the requirements mean, and for example, in the case of independence and impartiality and absence of conflicts of interest, they have looked into other international standards such as the Bangalore principles to articulate how they assess this uh, requirement, and they take into account. Uh, not only um, the um, when they assess the candidates' independence and impartiality, they take uh, into uh, account, um, you know, the, the also the appearance of lack of independence in the eyes of a reasonable person. So the uh, standards is quite refined, and I think that that's one uh, important aspect to uh, mention. Regarding expertise, the panel throughout the years has also move along towards refining, because it's not only having a master in human rights. I think that uh, one of the aspects that the panel has underlined is that those who want to be commissioners of, or judges of the Inter-American Court in many ways need to share and move forward the standards have, that have already been set up in the system. Because if we, um, um, uh, uh, again, if we uh, can, if we have candidates who indeed do not share those values, it would be different to be a member of the commission and a member or a judge of the Inter-American Court. And so I think that that's another aspect that has been included as part of the uh, requirement of, of expertise. And then in terms of institutionalization, I don't know, I think that uh, uh, Joel knows the Organization of, of American States very well, probably he can give us some light on that. But it has been very difficult. I, I guess that it's difficult to um, create these independent panels in political organizations. And so um, the states themselves have not been um, willing to take the step. 
but we are um, we have hopes that eventually uh, this the the vetting system will be institutionalized, uh, given all the um, uh, successful developments that we have had uh, at the OAS. Thank you very much, and uh, over to Milica to also uh, well react to the questions and comments uh, again from both your treaty body and the ICC expertise. Thank you, Felix. I believe uh, that. Uh, what Claudia just said is uh, crucial. Step-by-step -step change, step-by-step -step improvement. Even a three small changes could produce a significant improvement. The first one would be to add to the CV of the candidates brief explanation of the national nomination procedure implemented in that particular case. The second important change could be also to develop kind of questionnaires for the candidate to be publicly available, and the third important change to introduce a kind of round tables for the candidates and to offer opportunity to civil society organizations and academia and also to the state parties to based on the answers given in those publicly available questionnaires, pose additional questions and to have discussion with the candidates. So three small changes, but with the great potential to improve the things. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, uh, before closing, uh, to come back to you, to you Ambassador Joel, Joel Hernandez, again, to hear from the, the national perspective of Mexico, but of course, also from your um, <laughs> plentitude of experience in the in the OAS, uh, also from, from, from that system. And again, the question, can the human rights treaty body system also take forward any such steps, maybe small steps, as just pointed out, uh, via the next resolution in the General Assembly. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Felix. Actually, I have been evaluated twice by the independent panel uh, for the Inter-American System in years 2017 and 2021. And on the other side now, under my portfolio, is I have the responsibility for the selection of Mexican candidates uh, for uh, uh, treaty bodies and other international organizations. And with this, I can think that uh, we can uh, look into the example of the OAS on what and what uh, civil society has done. Claudia has explained it very well. Uh, civil society has played a key, key role in uh, promoting um, um, operative paragraphs in resolutions of the OAS General Assembly in order to call for gender parity border the Inter-American Commission and in the Inter-American Court, in addition to other criteria. And this, and this is having effects because we, we can remember that in the past, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights have one or two uh, judges. And now we are finally uh, reaching parity at the Inter-American Court. And, uh, and this is interesting because opposed to the ICC, where there is a mandate mandated parity. This, has, this is not the case in the statute of the Inter-American Court of the Inter-American Commission. So moving from uh, the regional experience and national experiences, the ones mentioned by Claudia with regard to the nomination processes in the US, Argentina, and Chile, I think we can uh, um, take the good examples into the uh, General Assembly resolution. As uh, it has been said here, it's a step-by-step -step process. Uh, it, we have to be realistic. It could be difficult to have some uh, um, 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 obligatory uh, requirements. I personally think that it's better to, uh, to, to, to take advantage of a proven experience and the, what has resulted uh, effective could be uh, incorporated in General Assembly resolution and from there to continue gaining momentum. I, in my presentation, I mentioned that we in Mexico are considering into a new way of selection of uh, candidates, uh, one where we can uh, make uh, open invitations for expression of interest and from there to develop a selection process in, in order to align ourselves to the, the, the most advanced international practice and mostly mostly directed to, to identify 
women candidates because that's our commitment uh, to, to put forward more women candidates. So that would be my suggestion step by step and looking to proven good practice. And there's lot to learn from the Inter-American experience. And of course, lot, uh, there's a lot to learn, to learn from the ICC nomination process that then we can uh, put in practice at the UN level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Ministers. Thank you, dear Joel. Thank you, dear speakers, for your uh, interventions, for that input, for really this uh, very inspiring discussion on how to move forward on this issue. Uh, because here at the Geneva Human Rights Platform, we are actually regularly trying to pilot new procedures of treaty body work, trying to show indeed in an informal setting how some procedures could work, could work better maybe, and also identify the challenges that new procedures might pose us. So I think for us, it will be interesting to see how indeed we can, along with what, what I hear you suggesting, also go forward and uh, see how we could help also and uh, engage with the NGOs also who do that already in that uh, piloting of vetting processes for the treaty body members. Uh, taking into account, Claudia, what you said, that it's a much bigger group of, of members, but also the inspiration, as, as the others have said, from the ICC, from the inter-American system on actually how to take that forward and how to make those positive examples, the good practice of Switzerland, uh, Canada, Mexico, and others who were not speaking today, but who do have good practices, of course, as well, how to take those forward and, and make those a standard procedure for the nomination and election process of treaty body members. So it will be an exciting project also to take forward within 2024. So next year, as uh, today actually was our last public event for us here at the Human Rights Platform. So to see what next year can be done. And I'm, of course, uh, very much counting on the continued cooperation with all of you, the speakers, uh, the participants and the audience. And I would like to close in thanking all of you, thanking again the co-organizers, especially GQUAL International Service for Human Rights, TBNet, uh, IDA, Switzerland, and Mexico for the cooperation in this event, which I hope can be a discussion to be continued in next year and also to be taken on in terms of seeing how that actually can have an impact then on the official procedures within the UN human rights treaty body system. So thank you all very much again for your participation and uh, have a good day, good evening to all of you. Thank you for that webinar that allowed us to join pe people in from different parts of the world. And of course, again, from New York and Geneva, the two main UN hubs where uh, treaty body actually